We're going to give you a little bit of in the news tonight. How's that? Yes. All right. We're going to give you a lot of in the news. And so tonight, as I give you in the news, let me scroll this down here. We'll talk about the New World Order. I'm going to give you something right from my heart and mind, and I want to just put this right out. We are 12 days away uh, from uh, what I am calling the shootout at OK What Now? And it promises the eclipse Wyatt Earp shoot out at the OK Corral on October 26, 1881. So now I've scratched some things that the Biden-Harris stand for. And I want you to know, I'm not doing this as a political thing. I'm doing this because of what they've said. So I'm going to list some things they said. It's not inclusive. Trust me, I could have gone all night. I'm going to list some things. And then for those that are out there listening to me, whether it's YouTube or whether it's through Facebook, lots of people listening, this is not, this is not based on a political party, although obviously there's political parties involved. It's based on what they've said. So you need to check yourself and check. If you are voting for Biden and Harris, then check what they have said. I just list a couple of them from off the top of my head. Just let me show you some of the things that I've listed. Well, we've got to get that background out of there if we can. Pastor Justin, can we do that? Get that background thing going up? Well, maybe not. Pastor Justin, can we get that background out of there? Somehow. Let me go up to here. Let's go back to there. Ah, thank you. Let's everybody give Pastor Justin a hand. All right. So a vote for Biden and Harris, this is what they have said, is more taxes, expanded LGBTQ rights, abortion backing, oppression of people of faith, evangelicals. We know that. They're coming after us, they said, she said. Renew Iranian arms deal. Horrible. Rejoin the Paris Climate Accord. Waste of money. More gun restrictive laws. Renew Palestinian funding, which goes right to terrorists. Uh, advance the Green New Deal, which will mean an increase in gasoline tax. It'll mean an eliminate fracking. Corporate energy consumption tax and a cutback coal production. They will increase the UN support, which, which Trump has not. More government agencies and more red tape, more handouts, open borders, sanctuary cities, less police funding, et cetera, et cetera. And I could have gone on and on. Now, a vote for Trump Pence is totally opposite of everything listed for Biden Harris. And then some. So I want you to understand that this is not just a political race. This is something that is really the future of America as we know it. It really is. This is a very, very crucial time. Let me give you a couple other things that we're talking about since we talk about socialism and how America is going. Let's talk about Venezuela and what's happening. Will the U.S. go the way of, of Venezuela? Scary. Uh, scary parallels. So here's how Venezuela ran out of food. Uh, pre prepping began to be frowned upon by the Venezuelan government. In 2013, many began to suspect that the outlook for Venezuela was grim when people became, when uh, prepping became illegal. It became illegal in Venezuela. Attorney General of Venezuela, Luis Ortega Diaz, called on prosecutors to target people who are hoarding basic staples with serious sanctions. Shortly thereafter, grocery stores instituted a fingerprint registry to purchase food and supplies. Families had to register and were allotted a certain amount of supplies to prevent hoarding. Now let's switch to the United States. Early in 2020, supplies began to be difficult to find due to the outbreak of COVID-19 and the potential of a lockdown uh, when folks couldn't find basics like toilet paper, paper and fingers uh, immediately began to point at preppers and hoarders. The word hoarding is being repeatedly used throughout the news uh, reports. They're already working to paint preppers as bad and selfish people. But this dialogue is still in place with people being shamed for large purposes when in fact they're simply getting necessities for a large family. Let's go back to Venezuela. It wasn't long until the basics were incredibly difficult to acquire. Then, just over a year ago, it became even more apparent that the country was fall failing when long lines of ba for basic necessities, such as laundry soap, di diapers, and food, became the norm rather than the exception. Thousands of people were standing in line for five to six hours in hopes that they would be able to purchase a few much-needed items. Let's go to the United States. Writers on the website have talked at this website here. I've talked about shells being cleared way back in March. What, what we may see in a shortage after halting many exports from China, and that's happening. And the fact that in most parts of the country, the supply chain is clearly broken. Uh, bare spots in local stores. Many areas still have limits on how many packages of toilet paper, cleaning supplies, and canned goods customers can purchase months after the original panic-fueled shopping sprees. It's not, in, it's not in Alabama, but I promise you it's in other parts of the United States. Let's see Venezuela. Let's continue the parallel. Shortly after the story broke to the rest of the world, the propaganda machine shifted into high gear. As the government began to ration electricity, it was announced that this was not due to e economic reasons at all, but instead was a measure of their great concern for the environment. Okay, let's go to the United States. We're looking at you, California, where PG&E, the largest power provider in the state, has shut off the power to people in rural areas repeatedly over the past couple of years to quote, prevent wildfires. Millions face the hottest days of the summer without electricity. 
Back to Venezuela. As stores struggled to provide the essentials to customers, the government stepped in to help. And, and basically, farmers in Venezuela were forced to hand over their crops last summer. They assumed control of essential goods like food and began putting retail outlets out of business. They began forcing farmers and food manufacturers to sell anywhere from 30 to 100% of their products to the state at the price the state opted to pay as opposed to stores and supermarkets. But that wasn't enough to keep the population fed. Isn't that astonishing how much less motivated people are to produce food and supplies when they're no longer allowed to benefit from, from their hard work? Historically, collectivism and farming have never gone successfully hand in hand. This January, the government told citizens of Venezuela that they would need to produce their own food. Let's go to the United States. As our supply chain dev devolved, it was learned that farmers in the United States were unable to get their products to market due to logistics issues. The closed packaging plants in totally different marketplace. Processing plants across the country were shutting down as more and more employees became ill. At least 10 large meat packing pr plants have closed due to the virus. Distribution issues have farmers dumping thousands of gallons of milk, plowing under vegetables in the field, this is in America, and leaving potatoes to rot. To summarize, farmers are losing billions of dollars and people are going without food while the food we have is left to rot. Hopefully, President Trump's new $19 million billion plan will allow the federal government to play, to play matchmaker between frustrated farmer and hungry families. So while nobody has insisted farmers hand over their crops yet without compensation, the government is clearly getting involved in the distribution of food. Venezuela. Eventually, all the measures the government of Venezuela took to hide the catastrophic collapse from the citizens could, no long, could hold up no longer. Venezuela right now is out of food. It only took three years from their first report about making hoarding illegal uh, for the once oil-rich country to fall into a ruin so extreme that there wasn't enough food for everyone. The United States. While we are by no means at the point where, we, where there is no food, there are all sorts of warning signs that, that they could come, and sooner than expected. Many aspects of our system are crumbling, and the supply chain is definitely broken. Stores are already pre preparing for the second wave of shortages, and a simulation has pre predicted a 400% increase in the price of food by 2030. And then, side note, I'm sure it's merely a coincidence, but Venezuelans lost their firearms around the same time hoarding was deemed illegal. Were you aware that Venezuela banned guns for private citizens a mere four years ago? 2012. Although the country was already in trouble, excuse me, 2016. Although the country was already in trouble, it seemed like that was the beginning of the end. Under the reign of Hugo Chavez, the government introduced a law that banned personal purchases of firearms and ammunition in an attempt to improve security and cut crime. At that time, Chavez's government said that, quote, the ultimate aim is to disarm all civilians. Most Americans are well aware of the concentrated efforts across the United States to undermine the Second Amendment. Over the past nine years, it has been operating. The side-by-side -side comparison is certainly not identical to the crisis in Venezuela, but there are enough similarities that you should be very uncomfortable with our present situation. So as we see the things, the, the, uh, things that are happening in Venezuela, and we look at America wanting to go to, uh, not everybody, but a lot wanting to go to socialism, man, it's pretty scary. Let me give you this next one as we come on. This says this, uh, COVID's Trojan, ho Trojan horse, the Great Reset and the Green New Deal. The climate alarmists in our day would have us believe that a grave environmental crisis exists, one that requires immediate and drastic action in order to save our planet. The leaders of the United Nations tell us that the solution requires all nations to submit to a central government, and they call it a new world order. Let me show you my title today that I've been giving for the last 15 years. So as we see it, they're calling, the, the United Nations is calling it a new world order. Every government should submit to it. The UN strategy for resolving the climate energy crisis consists of 17 goals that fall under the Agenda 2030. I've talked about it before. These objectives, however, go far beyond protecting our environment. They call for a Marxist type of government that distributes wealth evenly among all nations and all people. The World Economic Forum, WEF, refers to this the redistribution of wealth as the Great Reset. The quote below comes from Fox Business website regarding the WEF's meeting in June of 2020. We're still in the earliest phase of the Great Reset, they say. The full plan won't be rolled out until January 2021. Does that hit any, any, any uh, notes with you? When the World Economic Forum will host its annual meeting in Davos. The elites at the World Economic Forum can effectively control economic activity on a scale that has never been, afford, uh, be, been achieved before. The words effectively control economic activity sound remarkably similar to the words of Revelation chapter 13 which describes how the beast, the Antichrist, will control all buying and selling in the world. 
Agenda 2030 then, and its United States equivalent, which is the Green New Deal, are the engines behind the coming economic control that the elite globalists plan to impose upon the world. The Marxist nature of these programs is slavery, but in by any other name. According to Wikipedia, the Green New Deal, GND, is a proposed package of the United States legislation that aims to address climate change and economic inequality. Same as the, as the UN's 2030. A Washington Post article on February 11, 2019, GN, GND resolutions calls for a 10-year national mobilization following as its key goals the following. Guaranteeing a job with a family-sustaining wage, adequate family medical leave, paid vacations, retirement security to every single person in the United States. Providing all people of the United States with high-quality health care, affordable, safe, and, and adequate housing, economic security, access to clean water, clean air, healthy and affordable food, and nature. Meeting 100% of the power demanded in the United States through clean, renewable, renewable, and zero emissions energy sources. That's just not gonna happen. Listen, repairing and upgrading the infrastructure in the United States. Listen to this, I've said it before, this is absolutely ludicrous. Upgrading every single existing building in the United States and building new buildings to achieve maximum energy efficiency, water efficiency, safety, affordability, comfort, and durability, including through electrification. You know what that's saying? That's saying that every building, so let's start with the business buildings first. Every single building's gonna have to be upgraded. You know what that means if somebody doesn't upgrade it? They're gonna tax them. They're gonna burden them with a fine. And so this is the economic, the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal legislation leaves no aspect of human life outside of the realm of government control. Its description on the CNN website provides a frightening and chilling depiction of just how the elite would control all areas of our lives under the Green New Deal. A totalitarian government would guarantee the well-being of everyone in the United States. That's a joke. It would regulate all aspects of one's employment, housing, health care, availability of food, and of course clean up the environment, which is a secondary objective of the plan. It would ensure equal outcomes with all, for all with the elite choosing the nature of such outcomes. Doesn't that sound a little bit like being in prison to you? It does to me. The response of the world to COVID-19 has given the globalists confidence that they can control people through fear. Might there be climate lockdowns in the world's future? Listen to this. The, uh, a member of the UN's Committee on Developmental Policy, Mariana Mazzucato, recently wrote the following, quote, under a climate lockdown, governments would limit private vehicle use, ban consumption of red meat, and impose extreme and energy saving measures while fossil fuel companies would have to stop drilling. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is what they actually want to do. Can you imagine them telling you that you cannot have steak or a hamburger? Can you imagine that? That's what that's talking about. That you're going to be fined if you're on the road, that from Monday and Tuesday you can't have any gas driven vehicles on the road. Listen to what they're doing. Despite what he said in a debate, Joe Biden uh, and the Democratic Party fully support the Green New Deal and will work for its full implementation should they prevail in the election in November. The leaders of WEF fa fail to point out, however, the pain and suffering that will come from the move away from fossil fuels as they envision under the UN's Agenda 2030 and its counterpart, the Green New Deal. The planting, maintaining, and harvesting of crops requires a tremendous amount of fossil fu fuels. Beyond that, the food would never make it from the farm to our grocery stores without diesel fuel powering millions of trucks as well as numerous trains. And without fuel, it would be a very long walk for most of us to get our food home from the grocery store. Alternatives do not exist for all the fuel needed to support all the activities needed to meet the demands of even a fraction of the population of the United States, let alone the world. So it continues to go on. Climatologist Dr. Pat Michael says eliminating all fossil fuels will reduce the average Earth temperature by 0.14 degrees Celsius. That's an extremely small degree, and it puts humanity back in the Stone Age. The implementation of the Green New Deal would lead to record high fuel costs, and with that soaring out of control, food prices also. The economic fallout would devastate life in the United States and lead to starvation on a massive scale, like in Venezuela. As Dr. Michael said, it just might push us back to the Stone Age. But don't panic. The Lord told us thousands of years ago this is exactly what would happen. Bible prophecy provides a biblical context for the future new world order. The current climate change hysteria furthers Satan's agenda for a world government. The Bible describes the man of sin, the Antichrist, will have reigns on the world government handed over to him. Also be a world religion that will help subject all things under his evil control. I'll share more about what happened this week with the Pope.
Listen, the man is going to rise from what we know as Europe, Daniel chapter 7 says. Every, eventually things are going to get to the point where the economic, political, and even religious platforms of the world are going to be right where Satan wants them in order for this man to take control. The great reset, championed by the World Economic Forum, is nothing new. Both Daniel and the Apostle John prophesied about just such a world government would emerge during the tribulation. Daniel 7, Revelation 13. The globalists who push for a new world order act as Satan's minions, promoting his agenda to put, man, uh, to put his man, the Antichrist, in charge of all the nations, just as the Bible says would happen in the last days. Yes, it's exceedingly disheartening to watch the push for a totalitarian world government gain popularity under the deceptive guise of climate alarm. We must keep in mind, however, that I don't, not only does the Bible tell us this will happen someday, it provides details of the destruction of Satan's kingdom and the second coming of Christ. That's Revelation chapter 19. The Lord will totally destroy both the Antichrist and his kingdom at his second coming. What we see in our world is precisely what the Bible said would happen in these last days. A new world order of some sort will finally take place and shape before, the, before or during the initial stages of the seven-year tribulation. We already see the planning for this new world order in the United States Green, Nash, Green New Deal, in Agenda 2030 of the United Nations, and in the Great Reset of the WEF. All these programs have the same goal of unifying the world under the control of the elitist globalists. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is what's happening. The Great Reset will not be the utopia the WEF have advertised it to be. It will enslave all who are alive at the time. The good news is that we will already be with Jesus in the place he prepared for us before the Antichrist rises to world power. That's in John 14, 2-3, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1-8. For God has not destined us to wrath, the Bible says, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him, 1 Thessalonians. So, listen, I've been talking about it over and over again for years, and now we're starting to watch it come to play real quick, in real time. Let me give you this one. This article says, what will happen if the Democrats pack the Supreme Court? This is pretty amazing. Listen to this. Democrats flirting with court packing could destroy the Supreme Court and with it, America as we know it. How is that so severe? The following is a reasonable scenario. Amy Coney Bar uh, Barrett is confirmed to the Supreme Court, which gives the conservatives a 6-3 advantage. The, in, then in January, having retained the Democratic majority House, a President Joe Biden, if he's elected, and a newly Democrats-controlled Senate decide to, to undo the advantage. Congress passes the and Biden signs a new law expanding the court to 15 members. Biden appoints six new liberal justices, handing left a nine to six majority. What happens when the Republicans then regain power and they want a 60% conservative advantage? As a bit of algebra shows, to reverse the Democrats' 9-6 advantage, they'd have to expand the court by 7.5 members. Of course, they can't nominate half a justice, so they probably round it up to eight. Regardless, the Republicans, to gain a 60% advantage, must expand the court by more than the Democrats did, by eight as opposed to six. With each switch in power, they'd have to expand the court size by 50%. The key thing to note is that they would have to expand the court, not by a constant number, but by a constant percentage, because there's no law, no constitutional law that says how many there has to be. This is what would cause exponential growth. Let's err on the side of being less alarmist and assume that switch would only occur every 10 years instead of every four. Let's similarly assume the parties would only insist upon a 60% advantage. Under those minimal parameters, the court would expand by 50% every 10 years. In 100 years, the court would grow by a factor of approximately 58. And instead of nine justices, the Supreme Court would consist of 522 justices. Imagine the following scenario. In the year 2120, the court compri comprises 522 justices, 313 conservative, 209 liberal. That November, the Democrats retake the House, Senate, and presidency. Following precedent, they decide to regain their advantage and expand the court to 783 justices. Listen, further, in such a scenario, no voter would be able to remember when the court was smaller than 40 justices, let alone nine. Would they really care if it was expanded a little more? In other words, if the Democrats do as many of the leading members want them to do, uh, including Governor Jay Inslee, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and Mayor Pete Buttigieg, uh, as Vice Presidential Candidate Kamala Harris told the New York Times, she is absolutely open to, and at least one New York Times columnist advocates, we will no longer have a legislature and a Supreme Court judicial branch. We will, we will be political. It will be the end of the Supreme Court as we know it, the end of the balance of power among the three branches of government as we know it, and therefore the end of America as we know it. Would the Democrats do it? 
Well, given the left's record of destroying whatever it touches, most obviously the universities, high schools, and journalism, and most recently sports and sciences, if you're a betting person, you should bet on it. And so that's why it's so bad about expanding that. And let me give you this, talking about our, our uh, liberties. Twitter blocks uses, users from posting link to the New York Post story. A New York Post article about Joe Biden has found itself unable to be posted by users creating a war on free speech. Twitter has followed Facebook's example by censoring a New York, New York Post article about Joe Biden's foreign lobbying scandal after users were prevented from tweeting links to the story, leading one New York Post editor uh, to describe the move as a digital civil war. Here's my observation. Remember about 10 to 15 years ago, a group called the ACLU, how many remember them? They were suing everybody. Have you heard about them at all? You haven't heard a single thing. The ACLU would have jumped all over this. You know why? Because the ACLU is a democratic, liberal left group. That's why. They only protest things about conservatives. You know, I don't really care about Twitter. You know why? They kicked me off. Can you imagine? They did. They kicked me off Twitter. I wonder why. Twitter, I could care less. You can kick me off all you want. I'm going to still say what I feel I want to say because I still have First Amendment rights. I can say anything I want to say. All right. That's probably going to get me in trouble with Facebook, but who cares? Here you go. You ready for this? This is extreme hypocrisy on display uh, as a Palestinian leader checks into Israeli hospital for COVID. Sure, it's ironic that a Palestinian leader who accused Israel of spreading the coronavirus has checked himself into an Israeli hospital now that he's afflicted with it. This week's two-face is Saeb Ereket, the Secretary General of the PLO Executive Committee. Committee. He has served as the PLO's representative to various negotiations and as Yasser Arafat's spokesman uh, to the foreign news media. Among the blood libels that Ekrat has spread against Israel was his loudly publicized claim in 2002 that Israel massacred more than 500 Palestinian Arabs in Jenin. The actual number was 53, and they were terrorists who were killed in battle. A more recent anti-Israeli slander for him was his announcement on March 20th that Israelis were spitting on Palestinian cars and property in order to transfer the coronavirus to them. I'm quoting. When Ekrad himself came down with the disease last week, though, he had many Palestinian Arab hospitals to choose from. He could have opted to be treated at the hospital closest to his home, which is the Jericho Government Hospital. I've been to the Government Jericho Hospital. I wouldn't take my dog there. Or he could have gone to one of the 15 hospitals in PA-occupied areas. But no, Ekrad insisted on being taken to Hadash Hospital in Jerusalem, neighborhood of Ein Kerem. And the kind folks at Hadassah took him in. Uh, despite all the Jewish blood on his hands from all those years of terrorist attacks perpetrated by the organization of which he was and is a senior representative. I'm sure that he was a wise decision by Ekrat from a medical point of view. Any Israeli hospital is better equipped than any of the PA's hospitals. If you have COVID-19, Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or Haifa is the place to go, not Ramallah. But the question is why? It's not because Israel prohibits the PA from training doctors. It doesn't. And it's not because some Israeli blockade prevents the PA from importing medical equipment. There's no such blockade. Rather, it's because the PA re prefers to spend its money on guns, not, not butter, or in this case, guns and terrorist salaries, not ventilators. The PA has one of the largest per capita security forces in the world. The Palestinian uh, Shihab news agency reported last year that the PA has 65,000 troops. The PA spent more than $1 billion on those forces in 2018. What in the world does the PA need 65,000 troops for? It's not like the PA has ever fought any wars or is threatened by any country in the region. According to the Oslo Accords, the PA security forces are supposed to apprehend terrorists, but they've never taken that obligation seriously. 28% of their total budget goes to their, their military. Hassan Krishish, vice president of the PA's Legislative Council, told the Arab media, the security expenditures are much, much higher, reaching 35% of the public budget. Another big chunk of the PA's annual budget is used to pay imprisoned terrorists. In 2017, the PA paid $160 million to terrorists in Israeli prisons, another $183 million to terrorist families, total investment of $343 million in the PA's pay-to-slay terror program. All the while, their people are unemployed to the point now of 65% unemployment. Has been that way before COVID, by the way. And they're starving to death. Listen, imagine how many Palestinian Arabs' li lives may have been saved if the PA had spent even that part of that money on medicine and equipment to combat the coronavirus. Why even Saeed Ekret might agree to be treated in a PA hospital. 
the issue is important because there are some elements in the Democratic Party who argue that if they win the White House, I just showed you this, U.S. funding to the PA will be resumed. The reality of how the PA chooses to spend its money, however, offers a sober reminder of what a terrible mistake it would be to resume the old, failed policy of throwing American taxpayer dollars down the black hole known as the Palestinian Authority bank account. All right, let's go on. You still with me tonight? All right, Israel. U.S. exhorts Saudis to normalize with Israel, one nation after another. After the opening of the U.S.-Saudi strategic dialogue session, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo exhorted Saudi Arabia on Wednesday to join the changing dynamic in the region by recognizing Israel uh, after normalization moves of two other Arab countries. It's starting to happen. There's a divide going on the Middle East. There, it's splitting that, that area right in half. And so it's, it's playing up to have some type of war against Israel, even though there are some, some allies now, Arab allies, it almost sounds like an oxymoron to Israel, we know that Psalm 83 talks about a war. It's coming. And I believe the catalyst for that war is because Arab nations are starting to split their allegiances. And so we're watching that happen. One after another are going. Let me give you a little bit about the, about the economy. You know, I'm a little excited tonight. Let me tell you why. I'm excited because I've been talking about these things for years. Now, we, you and I may have been hearing it a lot for years, but now everybody's starting to get on board. For years, I've been talking about our, our economy. I've been talking about a digital dollar. This came out this week. It says, are you prepared for the imminent U.S. digital dollar? Listen to it. All Americans know everything costs a lot more than it used to. However, many people don't realize that inflation is driven by how much value the dollar has declined in the last hundred years. This chart shows the dollar has lost most of its value. There it is. That's the chart. This is in 1900s. A dollar, the, the, the dollar was worth a dollar. It says 100, but it's 100 dollars worth 100 dollars. Now you're going down to almost nothing. And so our dollar has been devalued. As that, and let me tell you why that's important. After World War I, 1917, the dollar, the US dollar, became the, became the world currency. It was what everybody traded. And they're still doing that. They're still trading in the US dollar only because of the strength of the dollar. Look at 1917. The dollar was at $100 at 80 some dollar buying power, more than any other country in the world. So if you were another country, you'd stockpile American dollars, which would, which would give the American dollar a great, a great strength. But we have eroded that strength by our inflation and by giving out everything. So listen to what's going on. The US dollar became the dominant currency in the global economy, again, as I said, soon after World War I. After 1944 and 1945 and World War II, it really strengthened, but it was still losing its power because of inflation. So however, there have been several global reserve currencies in the last 700 years with an average span of 94 years. These were the reserve currencies in the 1400s, 1500s, Portugal. 80 years it had a reign as a reserve currency of the world. They were all buying Portugal, uh, Portuguese money. Spain, uh, the, Spanish, the Spanish dollar, 110 years it reigned. Netherlands, 80 years. France, 95 years. Britain, 105 years. And America right now is over 100 years. But this is the extent of a, you know, of a, of a world power having a, having a reserve currency in their, in their money. The U.S. can accelerate the dollar's loss of status as the global reserve currency. And it has been doing so by escalating debt. And increasing inflation, which is now officially a, federal pol a Fed policy, declining domestic saving rates, and rising deficits. There have been discussions for several years about replacing the dollar with a variety of currencies, including the Amero for North American Union, to correspond to the Euro of the European Union. One bill already proposed earlier this year by Representative Rashid Talib, who floated the idea of a digital dollar to speed up the distribution of COVID relief payments. Just over 12 months ago, few thought the creation of a new U.S. digital dollar would soon be on the policy and legislative front burner in Congress. I thought the Federal Reserve or other regulatory bodies. Facebook's ambitious global Libra currency was announced in mid-June 2019. China began testing in April 2020 a digital yuan. Because Facebook is a global company, the world's banks are afraid people around the world might switch to Facebook's Libra digital currency. Amazon also has a digital currency. Coins by Facebook and Amazon are called stable coins. This key growing shift in currency is happening outside the awareness of many Americans, but not for you, because I told you about this two and a half years ago. Listen, it says this, the interest in a U.S. single dollar and central bank digital currency more generally was inspired early on by the success of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and its underlying technology. Tens of millions of people around the world now own Bitcoin, 
and has, it has a market value at present of approximately 170 billion U.S. dollars. Increasingly, a U.S. digital dollar is viewed not only as inevitable, but necessarily imminent. And so it's talking about going on. The following 2020 headlines show how close we may be to a digital dollar right now. Forbes on March 20, 2020. Shock U.S. digital dollar proposals set Bitcoin and crypto prices alight. Forbes, July, of, of July 1st, of 2020. U.S. moves closer to digital dollar reports. On June 30th, the Senate Banking Committee held a hearing on the future of the digital dollar. Wall Street Journal, the coming currency war, digital money versus the dollar. Central banks are getting closer to issuing their own digital currency. If they do, the dollar might finally face real competition as the world's dominant currency. Now you know why people want gold and silver. Coin Disc, Desk, 8, August 20th, the Federal Reserve is experimenting with a digital dollar. 8 14 2020 bitcoin.com federal reserve reveals building a digital dollar code base with mit uh, october 9th the world's central banks are quietly preparing to unleash digital currencies on an unexpected population so i talked about it we've talked about it over and over again i i'm telling you it's going to be it's going to happen let me give you a couple more let's go to religion anybody know who that is right there he finally did it this week, how many heard it? He finally did it. Why the Pope's words about civic unions for gay couples matter. No sooner had it been reported that Pope Francis had endorsed civil unions for same-sex couples. I can't even believe I'm reading this to you. I grew up as a Roman Catholic, and let me tell you something. This was something that they would have taken him, and they would have, they would have given him a glass meatball. And let me tell you what, what I mean by that. Whether you know it or not, you can look into the archives of the Popes. When they get way too old, they feed them something to kill them. Because, they're, because they're the, their, their voice is the voice of God. They can't make a mistake. And so can you imagine a senile pope? And so basically they have murdered their popes. And there's case after case down through the hundreds of years where they've done that. The only time they didn't do it is when they just retired a pope. Unheard of. But I promise you he's under lock and key. This is what's happening. He is endorsing civil unions for same-sex couples that Vatican watchers started arguing about whether this is a big deal or not. Of course it's a big deal. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church has long held the view that, quote, I'm quoting from their archives, man and woman were created for one another. Nor is it likely that the Pope will alter his opposition to so-called gender ideology that, in his view, denies the difference in reciprocity, uh, rep reciprocity in nature of a man and a woman and envisions a society without sexual differences. That's what he envisions. Thereby eliminating the anthropological basis of the family. The Pope's comments cannot be dismissed as idle talk. In an interview, the Pope said, quote, homosexual people have the right to be in a family. They are children of God. You can kick someone out of a family, nor make, you can't kick someone out of a family, nor make their life miserable. He added, what we have to have is a civil union law. That way they are legally covered. Does he have any idea that we're not talking legally here? He is the Pope over a religion, over a spiritual movement. This has nothing to do with legalities. Legalities comes from your society. Scriptural principles comes from the Word of God. The Word of God says it's an abhorrent. It's a, it's a sin. Sodomy is a sin. How many of you understand that? And so whether we want to accept it as a society, that's one thing. That, let them say, accept it. It's not going to change God's Word. That doesn't mean you hate homosexuals. It doesn't have anything to do with that. Don't believe the left when they tell you that anybody who's against homosexuality hates them. I do not hate a homosexual. I know several homosexuals who I minister to. So it's not like we hate them. It's just that we stick up for the word of God. Come on, somebody say amen. So we should, be, we should be talking of the spiritual biblical legality of it. And I am no longer going to call him the Pope. I'm calling him Mr. Pope anymore. The Pope's endorsement of civil unions, a legally recognized partnership that falls short of marriage, isn't new. He, suppo he supported civil unions when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires. And the National Catholic Reporter has excavated two uh, interviews during his papacy in which Francis seemed to commend that arrangement and distinguish it from a marriage. But his position is a departure from a 2013 Vatican statement saying, and I'm quoting a Vatican statement, Respect for homosexual persons cannot lead in any way to approval of homosexual behavior. So, basically what I think is going to happen, we're already they're protesting, I think the Catholic Church is going to split right down the middle. I think you're going to see priests coming out. I think you're going to see a whole bunch of bishops coming out because they don't all believe. They've been trained their whole life not to believe that way. They've been trained to believe in the Bible. So we're watching some things happen. That guy, by the way, Mr. Pope, right here, Mr. Pope is heading... He's at the head of the list, the short list, for the false prophet. Yeah. 
He said, if you're going to ask me who the false prophet is, if this guy stays, if this guy stays in power and, uh, and the, Lord, the Lord tarries a little bit and, or the Lord comes back, that man is going to be the false prophet. If not, he's setting the stage for the next one to be the false prophet. So you're watching it. I've never seen this. This is something unprecedented in Catholicism. It's unprecedented in the world. Let me give you a little bit more that's going on. And I like this one. Anti-Christian COVID tyranny compared to Hitler. Pastor John MacArthur has been fighting the Californian government to open Grace Community Church for worship services for quite some time. The intrusion of the life of the church is tyrannical and similar to other dictators, he says. According to MacArthur, actions taken by figures like Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom amid the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic all but expi explicitly require that the people of faith, listen closely, put government before God. A tyrannical, a tyrannical precedent often seen in the early days of an authoritarian dictatorship. I'm going to tell you something. I'm all for him and what he's doing because the government does not come before God. Don't tell me this isn't a necessary service. Don't tell me coming to church isn't a necessary service. It is. You can't keep bars open and, cut and shut down churches because bars aren't necessary. Churches are. Golly, I'm going to get really fired up tonight. I'm going to start screaming and spitting. All right, here you go. Biden's promise. Listen to this. Not only does this man not know what he's doing, he doesn't know what he's doing. Muslims at every level of government. I'm quoting him. Joe Biden addressed the 15th anniversary event of the Muslims Advocates, the Association of Muslim Lawyers, last Wednesday. In his address, he promised to introduce Muslims into every level of his administration. My administration will look like America. With No, it won't. That's dumb. There's only 1% only of America is Muslim. Now, if he said, in my administration, 1%, I'm going to get 1% Muslims, I could take that. But every place that's going to put a disproportionate number of Muslims in government, can you imagine Trump saying, I'm going to put born-again Christians in every single part of my government? Or can he say, I'm going to put Jews in every single part of my government? It's not representative. You know who you put in your government? The ones who are qualified. He's pandering to votes. He's pandering to votes. On day one, he says, I'll end Trump's unconstitutional Muslim ban. That's a lie, by the way. Trump doesn't have a Muslim ban. Biden was referring to the mislabeled Muslim ban, more accurately known as Executive Order 13769, titled Protecting the Nation from Foreign Terrorist Entry into the United States. He wasn't banning Muslims. He was banning terrorists. Oh. I want to get, I want to just tear everything up right now. As president, I'll work with you to rip the poison of hate from our society, honor your contributions, and seek your ideas. My administration will look like America, Muslim Americans serving at every level. In fact, Muslims at every level of America would look greatly, undecidedly unlike America, as Muslims, again, represent only 1% of the general population. It's also disturbing to imagine a government run by people chosen through their religious affiliation rather than their qualifications. At that point, Biden unabashedly is pandering for votes. One day before Biden addressed the Muslim group, Senator Bernie Sanders hosted at a virtual Get Out the Vote event featuring Muslim American elected officials. On one of the featured speakers was Rep Representative Rashid Talib. Muslim, she said this, I'm calling on our Muslims, all Muslims across the country to know that we have to take up the man who birthed the Muslim ban. She said we have to make sure we outvote the hate. Ironically, despite her declaration to battle hatred, Talib, an American-born descendant of Israeli Arabs, has, accu has been accused of making anti-Semitic remarks. Biden has been courting Muslim voters during his entire campaign. In July, he gave a virtual speech to Engage Action, a Mus Muslim advocacy group. During the address, he quoted a section of the Quran, which he thought sounded benign, uh, had, but it had significance recognized by Muslims alluding to the jihad, a holy war against all non-Muslims. He quoted something that represents in the Quran. This man, I mean, he needs, he really needs. He quoted something in the Quran that says death to all of the people who are non-Muslim. That means him and his family. <laughs> what is this guy thinking? That's right, he's not. All right, let me give you a couple more. God, I'm, I'm on tonight. Two different Jewish tribes choose different candidates. This is good. This, you, should, you should know this. Among the least surprising poll numbers to be published recently were the results of the Pew Research Center survey that reports the sizable 70% of American Jews say they are voting for former Pres Vice President Joe Biden, while 27% are planning to cast their ballots to re-elect President Donald Trump. Equally surprising were the results of two other polls. One was, a, oh, it was an AMI poll, a ma magazine poll, that showed that American Jews who identify as Orthodox, back, that's Hasidic, backed Trump over Biden by a whopping 89%. 
uh, to a smaller percent for, for uh, Biden. Uh, from I-24 News showed 63% of Israelis preferred Trump, Israelis living in Israel, while only 19% wanted Biden. That Israelis like a president who likes them so much is hardly a shock in much the same way that most citizens of the Jewish state didn't like President Barack Obama. Most American Jews being liberal, while Orthodox and Israelis lean to the right. You know why? Because Orthodox Jews take the Torah as serious. They take the Torah as God's word. And they know that Biden is not backing God's word. So Orthodox Jews are going to vote for Trump because they know, forget about what you think about Trump, whether he's crass or whether he's crude or whatever, he's backing some of the things of God's word. And whereas Biden's backing nothing of God's word. So most American Jews are liberals, but the Orthodox and Israelis lean to the right. It's not for nothing that the Jewish Democratic Council has produced ads that more or less accuse Trump of being a Nazi. Despite the offensive nature of these deeply inappropriate analogies, the Jews that support Trump are just as befuddled. They look at the president's record and wonder why any Jew would oppose him. They see the most pro-Israeli president America has ever had, as well as one who has taken more action against anti-Semitism, especially on college campuses, than any of his predecessors. They also trust some with the kind of close personal connections to Jews that Trump has in the form of a daughter who converted to Judaism, Jewish grandchildren, and close Jewish associates who have played roles in shaping his policies. At the heart of the difference between the Jewish Biden and Trump voters is faith. Liberal Jews who see voting for Biden as a no-brainer are in many instances the products of a culture that is far more interested in the universal aspects of Judaism and Jewish identity than its more parochial ones. For the overwhelming majority of non-Orthodox Jews, the liberal social agenda of the Democratic Party is what they consider to be the core of Judaism. The old or somewhat unfair joke that holds that non-Orthodox or Reformed Judaism is the, is the Democratic Party platform with holidays thrown in. Many liberal Jews still care deeply about Israel and its security. Nevertheless, it is not anywhere close to being their top priority. All right, astronomy report for the week. You ready? Yes. Okay, here's what's happening in the astronomy. You know, the stars are for signs, seasons, and times. So, several interesting events are happening in the skies this week and this month. Uh, the month is unique because we have a second full moon at the end of the month. And remind you, the Jewish calendar is based on full moons. This is, the, this is their high holy days. Uh, they, just, they just celebrated several of their feast days. This is, this is not without significance. It's an interesting fact, by the way. You lose two minutes of daylight each day through the end of the month, this month. Watch for the moon this week, uh, excuse me, this month, to sweep by Jupiter and Saturn. Each evening about October 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, you can see it with the naked eye. Look south to southwest, Jupiter is the brightest of the two. Watch for the moon to swing by Mars around dusk on October 28th, 29th, and 30th. And then Halloween, October 31st, Halloween night, a rare blue moon. It's called the Hunter's Moon, is going to appear in, in the sky. It's the second full moon of the month. And by the way, does it have significance? Yes. What is the significance, Pastor Mark? I don't know, other than the fact that it's right before voting day. All right, let me give you my weird news and we'll close it out tonight. How many of you have ever grown pumpkins? How many of you have ever grown pumpkins? What's the biggest size pumpkin you've ever grown, weight-wise? How many pounds? Three? There you go. Great Pumpkin squashes the competition at annual way off. Minnesota horticultural teacher Travis Geiger watered his winning entry 10 times a day. Being cooped up at home due to the pandemic paid handsomely for a Minnesota horticultural teacher who used the extra time to constantly water and feed a massive pumpkin that recently won this year's Half Moon Bay Pumpkin Contest in California. Geiger, 40, then drove his gargantuan gourd for 35 hours to see his hard work pay off at the 47th World Champion Pumpkin Way Off in Half Moon Bay, south of San Francisco, where it's where his winner came in at 2,350 pounds. And by the way, it's not the, lar the largest. Uh, the first time he won $16,000 for it, which is about $7 a pound. His pumpkin was the second heaviest ever weighed at the 40-year-old event, but it's still uh, far from a U.S. record. That was in 2018 when a grower in New Hampshire produced a pumpkin weighing more than 2,500 pounds. But the record for the heaviest pumpkin in the world was, I know you want to know this, was set in two, we have to offset that news. Come on, somebody say amen. Was set in 2016 at Giant Pumpkin European Championship in Ludwigsburg, Germany. A Belgium grower winning Whopper came in at just over 2,600 pounds. So those of you that are growing your pumpkins, don't even try it. That's in the news for tonight. I'm going to ask the, uh, I'm going to ask, uh, well, he's there, isn't he? There he is. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer for our offering. Let me give you a couple of announcements. Actually, two announcements. 
Um, I know there's probably a lot of people out tonight to looking for the uh, looking at the debate, and that's fine. But if you've ordered any CDs on uh, recently, we ask you to pick those up in the back. And also, that's on the uh, on the uh, left behind message that I preached. There's no Bible study next Thursday. Now I know some people show up, but next Thursday will be no Bible study. I'm going up to interview Joe Biden, so there's no Bible study next Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> let's all stand for a moment listen I want to pray for our offering tonight Father we just thank you and praise you tonight we thank you Lord God that you are still on the throne we're thankful tonight Lord God that we are your children Lord and that you look over every single one of us and tonight Lord God as we sing to you we're singing what a beautiful name let us remember what a beautiful name it is Lord millions of millions of people speak the name of Jesus tonight Lord and they speak it in reverence and in awe and we're thankful that we can worship you with this song bless this offering in Jesus name you can make your way to the, to the outside walls where those offering plates are in Jesus' name, amen.